So hello and welcome to the power of omics. My name is Madalina Opperman. I am the director of applications for sales support in chromatography and mass spectrometry MAR at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I will be your moderator for today's event. The three webinar sessions of today are part of a special event we are running this year in advance of the International Hupo Connect meeting. And they will be outlining the power of proteomics in key application areas. This event will discuss how scientists are harnessing the power of proteomics to advance scientific research. And each day you will hear first from our plenary speakers in the opening session. They are followed by selected scientists in the second daily session. Scientists will provide an overview of the current state of research in their individual fields. Daily, the third session will feature a roundtable discussion led by a prominent researcher providing a look towards the future and giving you the opportunity to join in what we all hope will be a very interactive and interesting discussion. Yesterday, we were tackling research and, the, and expanding on the theme of why we need proteomics to complement genomics, addressing how virus research drives knowledge and the development of vaccines and diagnostics. Tomorrow, we will take another leap. We will be going beyond and unleashing the power of proteomics. Today, the focus is proteomics and cancer, a new perspective. The promise of proteomics in the study of cancer has been with us for a long time now. We have witnessed a number of breakthroughs. Advances in technology, in applications, have significantly improved our condition and our understanding, enabling a deeper perception and understanding of cancer phenotypes. Protein-based knowledge offers insights that are directly actionable as they could be potential biomarkers or therapeutic targets. Latest proteomics technologies and workflows are emerging as high-throughput, comprehensive, quantitative, targeted, enabling cancer proteomics to complement genetic information. The session includes areas to study various aspects of cancer disease, encompassing cancer pathway proteomics, proteogenomics, immunopeptidomics, as well as examples of standardization across laboratories, making data gathering a major effort and, a comp and providing comprehensiveness of outcomes. With the research community driving proteomics to realize its full potential for cancer prevention, diagnostics, and treatment, we will also feature a roundtable session focused on the need to maximize information from a proteomic dataset that can deliver faster insights with almost no errors to help accelerate the search for biomarkers or monitor therapies for their effectiveness. So without any further delay, I would like to turn over the floor to our first presenter, to Professor Georgi Marko Varga from the University of Lund, whom we have to, the pleasure to have as our invited speaker for the plenary session. Professor Marko Varga, over to you. Okay, so thank you for the kind introduction. So today I would like to tell you about the um, an ongoing activity we have in a collaborative effort with the NIH in, in a partnership in the US, uh, where we have established the European Cancer Moonshot uh, here in Lund, Sweden. So it's actually linked to a, um, a uh, healthcare uh, area region in southern Sweden with 10 hospitals. And also, uh, we are uh, collaborating in a multi-center uh, approach globally 
uh, with uh, Tokyo uh, and also with uh, Seoul in Korea, as well as uh, Semmelweis and um, Seged Hospital in, uh, in Hungary. So in this effort, I would like to show you uh, the activity that we have right now ongoing in the European Cancer Moonshot. And um, so we are also engaged um, together with uh, uh, Professor Malm, uh, where we are in the governmental uh, team uh, setting the activities for Cancer Moonshot uh, in Sweden uh, in, in collaborative effort on a national basis with NIH. So that uh, work is ongoing uh, right now and there will be a focus to certain uh, cancer areas. Um, so here I show you sort of a, some views of, of where we built the, the uh, European Cancer Moonshot, and that is um, within the Biomedical Center, so it's located within the hospital area that is quite extensive in Lund. So um, uh, that's on the, the left-hand side photo. And then, um, on the right hand lower photo, you can see the, the, the big block building. So it was like 800 beds. And then on top of that, this uh, colorful building is actually the, uh, the radiology center where we uh, quite newly um, established where they have uh, really frontline uh, treatment for, for uh, cancer patients. Uh, the team uh, in Lund is very international. So we are like uh, all in all uh, 40 scientists and uh, we come from uh, 15 different countries. Uh, and it's very much uh, sort of a, a build of this team where we focus on scientists. A few of us, we sort of reached uh, 50 plus and then uh, to use the experience of these uh, somewhat older scientists uh, many of these are, have uh, experience from uh, pharma industry or biotech industry, and then uh, to link that with uh, young, excited scientists, postdocs, and researchers uh, who uh, come to us so either in collaborative efforts or uh, via uh, the centers that we collaborate with, or just by ad hoc if we meet up or they contact us and they, they come over for a shorter or a longer period stay. Now, the recent um, joint effort we have is with Brazil. I'm very excited about So we, we partnered in we, with Brazil and uh, we have uh, research activities, clinical studies, uh, PhD students as well as uh, senior scientists and also we uh, have a genomic center uh, in Rio de Janeiro where we do uh, joint efforts in, in um, different study activities. So this is a, a newly established part. Now within the European Cancer Moonshot activity, uh, we put a very strong uh, emphasis on outreach. And I mean outreach to, the, uh, to society, to the population. And so we would like to build uh, cancer awareness. And the whole idea is also that we would like to have, since we have the patient in the center, uh, it's also very often the case that involves that it involves uh, relatives, family, and friends. So usually the patient is not alone. However, the patient is in the center, and we uh, we consider then that the research uh, area of resource as well as the healthcare, the hospitals, are actually. Uh, in order to provide uh, support uh, and care and find solutions uh, for the patient. So in this way, we, we, we work this together, we work together uh, with different organizations uh, to build this further uh, as we go along. Now, I'm gonna show you a few uh, parts here where this is an open house event that we did. And this was like half a day from lunch to to early evening, and here you see the biomedical center building, and then on the right hand side you, you see you see the uh, the the big block, uh, and also uh, uh, you see clinical uh, chemistry over here, pharmacology. And what we did here was to invite uh, 
uh, anybody who uh, wanted to attend. And we actually got quite a lot of uh, uh, young uh, people from society and also from high schools. We had uh, athletes from, from sports uh, clubs we also had a swimming team with like uh, 80 swimmers who came along uh, to make a visit and all the postdocs and, and young scientists they were out in the labs uh, demonstrating and showing what's going on and what's actually happening at, at the european cancer Moonshot center so i put together a few uh, slides here of photos uh, from this uh, open house event and on the left-hand side here, you can see that um, on the lower part, uh, we have uh, Istvan, who is the dermatologist and pathologist, who uh, then makes a, a mole testing on one of the visitors, the girl here, and making a, a, a picture, and then uses a, a software tool developed uh, in order to investigate the, uh, the properties of the mole and whether there, there are any signs of, of possible malignancy uh, uh, early early indications. So this is how um, we demonstrate the technology development and how we actually are able to, to work together. Now, um, above you see uh, this man with the inhaler. Uh, on, it's not an inhaler, sorry. It's a, uh, it's a device for, for long volume measurement. So it's a spirometry. And uh, uh, he's actually a lung cancer patient, it, it, it turned out. And also we had that demonstration, so you can actually follow the curve of, of inhale and exhale volume, long volume, and thereby you can make readouts uh, whether there are any particular uh, problems with, with the lung compartments. So uh, in the upper uh, part, you can see uh, the labs that we have. So this you recognize, so these, these are uh, mass spec labs where we do all the um, uh, protein analysis sequencing. Uh, some very interested uh, uh, visitor who checked out that can you really measure these small volumes here? It's incredible. And then on the lower uh, end here on the right, it's actually Marcel from from Semmelweis that uh, uh, makes a a live demo of not live but a demo of uh, pathology where uh, he's using digital pathology in order to be able to identify different uh, clones of cancer cells within the tumor. So all of this is really to try to understand how the disease presents itself. And when you do that, then you can also further see the, um, the actual battle in between uh, the invader, so the cancer cells, and then the defense system that is our immu immune system. Uh, and this is what we are then focusing on, trying to understand mechanisms that drive the, the cancer development. Now, if we look to the uh, stage from early, uh, very early indication, until uh, stage four uh, and mortality, uh, there is a clear development of, of how the, this, this happens in, uh, uh, in melanoma. Uh, uh, development uh, for for malignancy in patients and usually what you see is that you get some uh, mole that that sort of grows or, or or has another shape or 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 color so there is an a b c d e uh, way of classifying that and then we also participated uh, in the um, who new classification uh, setting that has been made as the the eight of that we then uh, align with and we characterize all the, the tumors based upon that. And then you, you move, usually you can have a, from the primary, what you then find is that you get a development of, um, of metastasis uh, spread. And that is usually, uh, it can be lymph nodes uh, development that is most common. And then it can also uh, progress to, to next stage of stage three uh, where you, you see more and more uh, a grow of the size of these lymph nodes. And then in stage three, uh, usually you get uh, a much more uh, aggressive uh, metastasis spread. Uh, it can happen through vascularization, or it can also happen by other means. But, but the main thing here is that you, you will um, end up with uh, 
where you have metastases and uh, tumors uh, of uh, melanoma uh, in the lung uh, and in the brain. So usually that's stage four and actually very few percentage of, of those patients actually make it uh, and ha can have a longer survival from that stage. So these are our are parts that we divide in uh, the patient groups and also we investigate um, uh, drug treatment so the impact of drugs and how uh, the patient change uh, in terms of uh, disease presentation um, so here is an example i took um, from a from a uh, publication uh, some time ago where you can see um, with drug treatment where you have very efficient um, a breakdown of, of tumor development. So you see here in between uh, the left hand um, images or, or photos of, of this man uh, from front and back. And you also can see after 15 weeks of, of targeted uh, treatment uh, with personalized medicine of the impact of, of how uh, improvements uh, are made. So there are, uh, there are quite some uh, new developments, uh, especially also on immunotherapy that is uh, showing a very good progress. Um, and then we will allude to how that goes about. Now, if you think about a patient uh, that you see on this slide, I, I made a way. So usually what you find throughout a, a lifespan of a disease, a disease of moment. So in the very left corner here, you have some uh, cells that have been uh, activated by, by mutations, different type of mutations. And these are the drivers of, of, of tumor growth. And usually what happens is that you come into the hospital, the patient does, and then from that diagnosis, you actually uh, start to grow uh, the primary tumor. Uh, and that's when you, when you notice. So by some sort of imaging technology, CT or MRI, this is then manifested, and then what you do is then you, you uh, make a um, isolation of the tumor and usually uh, and make a, a treatment impact. So it can be by drugs and surgery or surgery alone. And usually what happens is that the tumor burden comes down. So then this, this tumor is manifested. And then some period of time elapsed, so typically uh, three to, to nine months or even some Patients can go several years, but then uh, somehow uh, after treatment, uh, this, act, this tumor, even though you have seen on the CT that the tumor burden is zero, that means that the entire tumor has disappeared, uh, it will come back. So there will be a resistance build or a, a, uh, a new relapse. And then what you will see is that you will come up with a new, more intense, uh, tumor development, and then the you you and the blue arrow indicates uh, an action by the hospital, uh, and then it goes down again. But then you're in a phase where you actually have repeated recurrence, and and in the end, this actually will bring, uh, in most cases, uh, the patient to to mortality. So they will not make it. So so what we are mostly managing to do here. Is, is to prolong life uh, of these patients in many cases. So uh, the golden rule is the earlier we can indicate, the earlier we can find it, the higher chance. So in the beginning, you have like 90% chance of making in stage one. When you come to stage four, you have less than 10. So it's, it's early indication is really important. Okay, so if you go from here to uh, some of the, the, the factors that actually uh, impacts on whether you're gonna get uh, malignancy or not, it's not really fully understood, but it is related to to, um, uh, to heritage. Uh, there is a genetic uh, heritage, but also that you have during your lifetime a, um, a change and a mutation of genes that then will alter also uh, in protein mutation. And, and that is where uh, drugs are developed in order to, to address the, the the protein regulation. And um, exactly how this uh, comes about is not really known. However, uh, uh, based upon uh, the Weinberg principle, uh, we do know that in, in most uh, 
cancers, you have uh, key regulating genes and proteins. So, and these are the, 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 the drivers. Now the drivers themselves uh, are key in, in driving the, the, the growth of the tumor and also the proliferation. So that means that um, they cannot manage alone. So they need sort of uh, passengers. So the passengers are the one that is, is helping the drivers to move the, the proliferation and the growth and also to drive uh, the tumor uh, into metastases. Um, I have listed here uh, BRF, NRAS, KIT, uh, et cetera, and also the, the passengers. These are the most commonly uh, well-known for, for uh, melanoma. And so what we do with this is that we have now uh, the genes identified, and we are currently looking into the, to the protein expression, and, and, and then how these uh, counterpartly uh, in, uh, uh, come together and whether there is an absolute overlap uh, of the gene uh, mutation expression uh, in the protein. And what we have found is that this is actually not the case. So here I, I show you um, a few uh, uh, images and, and uh, pictures of um, patients that we uh, exemplified by patients that we uh, isolate by surgical intervention uh, smaller early tumors like up in the left-hand side uh, and also uh, examples uh, of other uh, in, in, in the face and also uh, on other places of the body. And also uh, on the right so here you see also that there are, is an example of a 75-year-old uh, uh, patient who, um, who during a 10-year period actually got local reoccurrence uh, on the leg that looked like uh, not harmful at all, but then eventually actually ma made, uh, made uh, the situation worse and, and could not be handled. So this patient pa passed away 10 years later. To the right-hand side, you see a, uh, it's, it's a young uh, male who, who also came into the clinic uh, in, in Seged where they found first some, some moles in the beginning with uh, focal, and also uh, later they were able to manifest uh, the dissemination of the disease. And you see uh, that this patient also had like uh, seven, six, seven years uh, of development and then, then passed away. And you see that there are uh, metastases spread throughout the, the head and neck part that is quite severe. So these are common uh, cases uh, in these patients. So. When you look to these uh, different situations of these patients, uh, and we do do quite high numbers, so we do hundreds and hundreds of these patients on a yearly basis. Uh, we did a, a small pilot where we looked at uh, primary tumors, we looked at the expression of, of lymph node metastasis tumors, and also uh, primary uh, melanoma cells that were I isolated, and then uh, we looked for the comparison of protein expression. And these are in the reach, range of six to 7,000 proteins. Uh, and if you do a, um, a computation of this, uh, you will see on the right-hand side that the, the red ones, the primary tumors, is actually pretty spread out. So they are more uh, dis-alike. Uh, while on the other hand, for instance, if you look to the cell line, they are pretty much uh, similar, having uh, commonly uh, distributed expression of proteins. Well, the lymphos are, are, are also a little bit similar to Ceylon, but, but still, still they are, are, are uh, uh, grouped together. And uh, typically when you isolate uh, cells, I mean, they, they will then proliferate and, and, and keep the same. So that is um, what we uh, envision throughout. Uh, and here also, if you go from proteins to genes, uh, we have also in collaboration together on proteogenomic studies, uh, mutation burdens where you look at uh, targeted mutations and you can look that throughout the, 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 the patient groups and you can see uh, to what frequency uh, the most uh, common uh, genes are mutated in different forms. And this is also a fingerprint of, of what's going on uh, in, in a given study. Uh, we have spent a lot of time uh, working together with uh, pathology units uh, and also, for instance, in, in uh, first department of 
pathology at the, at the Tokyo Medical Hospital, uh, where we are investigating the heterogeneity of, of how the tumors uh, present themselves. And, and the big, this is really the big challenge because uh, there is a, a very broad window of, of how uh, the morphology in a tumor looks. So you can have uh, various degrees of, of uh, uh, cancer cells, different clones. Uh, you can see that they have different form and shape of cells. You also have to, you can also see that the stromal component it is important um, in, in the complexity of how tumors develop. And there are specific roles of, of, um, of the stromal part as well. Uh, and then you have the, the infiltrating loop. Uh, lymphocytes as well that that takes part in the action that you can see uh, in these uh, uh, tissues from patients isolated. So we reported this just uh, just recently in in a a, a major study uh, in um, in cell biology and toxicology. And here I I put uh, together with Istvan a um, an assay we developed for BRF uh, uh, V600E that came out really, really well. And, and each one has a lead and is really uh, professional in this area. So on the left-hand side, you see a pretty homogenous uh, expression, uh, the brown color of BRAF when it's mutated. And on the right-hand side, you see that you have an upper image. It's really only only like small islands of of, uh, of the brown color that you see. And that, that is the... Uh, uh, the cancer cells where the BRAF mutate that the protein is is highly expressed. And, it, and a magnification on the right-hand side, on the lower, you see that there are small clones that, that look very different uh, within uh, the in, intra-heterogeneity uh, example uh, of, of, a, um, of a tissue isolated from, from patient. So all of this we do in, in a very uh, structured way. And um, we have developed a, a massive investment in biobanking. We in, uh, here you see Henriette, who is the head of the biobank team. And we uh, have everything uh, barcoded. We have software to drive everything. We have electronic surveillance of all the steps we do. And we we'll then link uh, these features to, to the uh, data generation. So that's the molecular pathology as we identify and uh, here you see the the, um, the Lyconic uh, automated biobank, fully robotics at minus 80. It's a really impressive uh, capacity of almost six, six million samples. And then now we are uh, approaching uh, two million samples uh, at, at this stage. And um, from here, uh, we really uh, make more and more uh, investigations of uh, how proteins and genes uh, express uh, in tumors. And we are particularly interested also in, in drug intervention and the impact of drugs, what happens. So we look at immunotherapy, we look at targeted therapy, usually it's, uh, it's BRAF, and then also chemotherapy in some cases. And of interest here, of course, is... Uh, modification of proteins that relate to a certain signaling cascade can be specific phosph phosphocytes and, and also the, the entire set of kinases we so, sort of uh, reached out now. And also we're interested in how we can see differences in between expression um, when you build up a drug resistance. So all of this is in order to, to more understand the mechanism uh, that is actually not very well understood today. So this is uh, a lot of the, the, the focus right now that we are uh, together with the NIH team in Bethesda sort of pushing and also within this uh, 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 collaborative partnership. And here is an example on this slide where you have the, 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 the transcript expression uh, in correlation with the, uh, with the protein expression. And in this case, it's... Uh, the study where we did like 100 patients, the crossover here uh, is like almost uh, uh, yeah, around 40%. And uh, there has been proteogenomic studies 
uh, in different cancers uh, published where you uh, currently there are data from 22 percent up to 60 percent so around 40 percent is is pretty good okay so um we did in this study also uh, a, an observation and a computation uh, resulting outcome that I think is really exciting, and that is that we could use the, the clinical uh, data, uh, so the metadata from, from the clinic, in order to divide uh, and, um, and uh, cluster uh, all the data we generated in the study uh, so that we were able to divide these in three uh, groups. So one group based upon the protein expression, we could identify uh, to be long survival, uh, medium survival, and short survival. So we did find 25 proteins that associated to the ability to distinguish uh, in between uh, the outcome uh, of the patient. And um, we, did, we then selected where we had uh, a borderline of 15% of tumor at least that you need to have. So that is, the, that is what we um, encountered in this study that we call Primero. Okay, so um, now looking at proteins, uh, having the, the, the clinical material in, in terms of tissue, uh, well, uh, imaging, I mean, looking into what you really can, can envision in, in a tissue by uh, molded imaging. Um, on the left-hand side on this uh, presentation, you can see that you have um, tissue where you can divide it in by histology, the different parts. And what I found extremely exciting was that we are now able to determine based upon the expression in this different uh, region within this um, tumor exemplified here uh, to give a certain uh, uh, fingerprint that is designed for the different parts. So for tumor cells, for lymphocytes, connective tissue that can be can be investigated. So this is something that I think will have a, a, a very uh, important uh, future bearing. Um, we also have Yonatan uh, uh, Eriksson, who's a PhD student in our group that has done a really nice development of, of software uh, cluster-wide peak detection methodology, whereby uh, you can see here, you can go in and you can investigate and in histology side here uh, where you then actually can map that in, in a raster set and like a, a barcode you can then get very very high resolution so if you look to the to the um, masses uh, and the differences of the masses that that uh, you can do by by this software development is really impressive and we also did another um, application here where we had a melanoma tumor development late stage uh, in a patient within the lung uh, pulmonary tract, uh, isolated surgically, and then we uh, looked for the vemurofenib, uh, that is the targeted drug uh, binding the, the BRAF and thereby blocking the, the, uh, the tumor growth. And here you see uh, uh, images that, that with the binning with, with a very, very high resolution of masses. So this is an example where you can actually localize specifically where the drug uh, is, um, is, is located and where it ends up. So the question you're a asking here, does really the drug uh, hit the, the, the tumor cells and where you have a mutation uh, of the BRAF? Yes or no? So, and then the special, spatial resolution is like a, a single cell that you can make. Now, um, we also have uh, another uh, study example I wanted to show you where you really can do, do deep mining. And, and um, in this uh, study with the MM500, um, as you can see on this slide here, we really had, uh, have collections from a number of um, metastases from different uh, uh, organs and anatomic regions within the body uh, of, of patients that we have um, in collaborative effort uh, with Sagan and, and Semmelweis uh, done. And um, the data here are, are really extremely uh, detailed. So 
here we did a, um, a, a ranking uh, of the proteins expressed in melanoma uh, according to abundance. So what you see here is actually the, um, the melanoma proteome. So we believe that we cover almost 16,000 here, and we believe that we have the majority of all the players uh, of proteins that have a, a functional role to play within the, within the tumor biology. Uh, and um, many of these are mutated, and they're also dysregulated pathways uh, that have been uh, investigated in quite some detail. Um, and then we also had a, uh, uh, done a study where we looked to immunotherapy. And there has been uh, data from us, but also from other uh, scientific groups where we have been able to, to work uh, and look for proteins that are regulated based upon treatment. And in a study, we, we picked out 25 proteins that we had and then went through a high number of patients in the MM500 study, actually 505 uh, tumor samples, uh, where you can display uh, the impact of expression of these. Uh, another study that we call uh, Quarto uh, is uh, then something that we are very excited about. So this is a a uh, semmelweis study where we are looking into the uh, to the uh, side where primaries and metastasis uh, we also have a non-tumor uh, sample uh, here and you can have tumor microenvironments and you can local recurrent uh, uh, tissues and also cutaneous metastasis lymph nodes and distant metastasis so it's quite quite a, a diverse um, presentation uh, of what you find as a disease presentation from patients. And if you look here, you see uh, four the different type of, uh, of tissue uh, from this patient, uh, the expression patterns for each and every one of these samples. So typically you get something like uh, 9,000 proteins identified. So this is a non-labeled uh, approach that we do. Uh, and this is uh, a, um, a, a 90 minute gradient we run. And as you can see, there are um, a lower expression on the non-tumor side while the, the cells, the cancer cells are activated. You see that, that there is a, uh, a uh, increase in the uh, proteins expressed in, in these uh, tissues. Now, this slide here, I think is, is really uh, something that we are using now more and more. So we have typically not been able to uh, always statistically significantly uh, prove that we have a, um, a change of expression of, of given proteins of interest. And uh, what we have done now is to use an MCM complex that is actually a uh, complex linked to the DNA uh, that is linked to, to cell growth uh, in, a, in a tumor uh, proliferation. And here, this MCM complex has six proteins, and they have our in stoichiometry one-to-one. -one. So what we did was to uh, quantify these six proteins and, and try to relate them to this. Uh, and then we also investigated, uh, because uh, to a biomarker, uh, KI67, that was uh, first uh, uh, developed and, and, and found by, by a Japanese team. Uh, and we related to KI67. And here we were able actually to, to relate primary tumors and metastases uh, in a nice way to this MCM complex expression. And we use that as a nominator uh, in order to, to see upon the uh, upon the uh, expression. So here you can see on the left-hand side, the green. So many of those are then uh, uh, lower level of, of uh, turnover or pro proliferation, uh, some of the metastases and, and the healthy, of course, is in here. And then on the right-hand side, as extreme, as a very highly uh, proliferative, uh, then you can see that primary tumor and other type of metastasis are. So we use this approach in order to be able to 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 get more out of this. And um, uh, MIT, MITF is is a uh, a uh, target protein that has a key role in in the, the drive 
uh, of, of uh, tumor development, and we could actually find directly significance of regulation, uh, both with and without the MCM complex approach. However, the newly uh, presented DDX, uh, 3X uh, gene that we identify now on a protein level, uh, published uh, very recently in Cell, uh, we could find that um, we couldn't directly get an upregulation of the protein. However, if we related it instead to the MCM complex, then we actually could find significance. So this is a play of how you can uh, develop uh, other ways of, of uh, variables uh, being introduced using uh, proteomics. Um, here is another example that I took where uh, you can see that um, uh, BRF, NRAS, and, and KIT, they are key players uh, in, uh, in patient tumors. And, and here we are establishing now the correlation in between these protein abundances and, and mutation status in order to try to understand the mechanism whereby these are, are, are regulated and, and mutated. And um, we are now establishing a database for this as well uh, in order to, to get more details. So this is something that we are uh, moving into uh, in more depth. So in conclusion, I would say that um, uh, we have been working for quite some time now, over a number of years, where we uh, very often come from a, a healthy status uh, on the upper left here uh, of a patient that, that somehow enters into an early stage uh, of disease development in melanoma. And then what happens is that you, you get some, some sort of uh, development of a tumor. And, and in this case, uh, we actually have a clinical metadata. So we follow the patients over uh, the entire uh, period that they are visiting the hospital. And they are very dedicated and they are very eager to, to provide sample. So that works very well uh, for us. Uh, we do this mostly in southern Sweden now. Uh, so from early indication to, to, to until the patient uh, pass away, we have a number of, of samples. If there is a surgery involved, we get the tissue also. Uh, if there is um, no surgery but uh, a checkup or visit to the clinician, uh, we always get a, um, a blood samples that are taken. And uh, in our uh, workflow routine uh, in the biobank, we uh, store the sample into minus 80 within two hours. So that's the, the, the default the system that we run. And then also we do a lot, and a lot now on um, uh, sequencing transcripts mostly. Uh, we also do, do protein analysis that I showed you examples from uh, acetylation, phosphorylation, methylation, uh, modification based upon uh, treatment, but also, uh, and then uh, try to get more and more information with computation uh, in signaling pathway cascade to try to understand what happens during the disease development. And when you add a drug and you have an effect by the drug, how does that actually change the tumor and what happens with the patient? And, and, and I would also like to, to, um, to uh, give credit to, uh, uh, to um, uh, both Marcel and Istvan and the pathology team and the clinics who are doing a fantastic job in really characterizing uh, all the, the tumor material that we work with. And we as, as not, I mean, medics, most of us, but we have uh, six uh, MDs within our team, uh, most, uh, but we learn all the time. And I think that's very important in order to increase the, uh, the understanding. So from here, I, I conclude, but uh, I would like to, to just uh, remind you that um, in Sweden, we are welcoming you to UPO 2021. So 2020 was expected for Stockholm, but um, you know, COVID came in, in, in between here. So we, we run that now as a uh, virtual meeting uh, and then we will follow up and have you uh, visiting Stockholm hopefully uh, for next year. And the reason you should come is also because Sweden and Stockholm of course is a fantastic place, but it's because we also have now um, a theme where we really want to make a difference this time and try to build uh, more uh, towards the uh, treatment uh, and some of the 
the areas we will focus on you see in this slide, but also it's really the, the disease understanding uh, and also with the treatment and also what technology can do for us. And it, it is, we, uh, we call this now the, the clinical proteomics for the benefits of the patients. And we, we, we feel very strongly for this and we welcome you uh, to participate. So, of course, it's uh, very important to, to give also the, uh, uh, our partners and the funding bodies who provide resources so that we can uh, do what we are best at. And um, uh, I would uh, in particular like to, to, to thank the Fru um, Berta uh, Campus Stiftes IKEA that has been extremely supported throughout a number of years uh, ever since the nine years that I, I, I left AstraZeneca and I came uh, to the clinic and, and to the university here. Um, and then also um, NIH, uh, NCI, uh, the team over there in Bethesda that I think are, are extremely uh, important to us in order to guide us and also to, to keep us really on the front and push forward. And, and, and um, Thermo, uh, I, I would like, not because I give the talk here, because I think that they have participated not only by having you know, instruments and development, but actually listening and also being part of our build and being interested and also being pushing. So I, I, I value that a lot. And uh, visits to, uh, to San Jose every year, once or twice, in order to brainstorm, I, I think that is really extremely valuable. Lyconic instruments, they have been extremely supportive on the biobank side. We would never manage without uh, um, the, the team of, of less corps. I think it's really important. So university and others, so um, the healthcare sector of Egenskjön in Sweden uh, are, are of course uh, of importance. So uh, we are very active on social media. And here you see myself and, and you one in the clinic when we visited for a week uh, before the COVID came uh, last year. Uh, we spent in, in surgery and, and in the hospital in Seged. And um, with that, I would like to finish off and thank you for your attention. And um, I will be happy to take uh, questions QA later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Marco Varga. Uh, it's been a, you've been regaling us with a great presentation. Uh, something to mention is that the audience can submit questions in the Q&A box, so please, we invite you. And we have already received a number of questions. So, uh, Professor Marco Varga, the first question is oriented towards um, having access to material. So practically you go about obtaining such high quality samples and what defines the high quality sample, which processes do you have? Well, thank you, Madeline. I think that uh, the only way you can do it and do it well is by collaborating. So I think uh, our experience is that you need to team up uh, with the healthcare sector. And if you do that uh, in your own country, or if you collaborate like in the, in the case of, of the European Cancer Moonshot, clearly this is Europe, but we also have uh, links to the US, uh, Japan, and, and Korea. And different uh, countries have different legislations, they have different ways. However, what is common uh, is the overall uh, WHO uh, regulation and guidelines. And I think also NIH plays an important role here. So I, I think only by, by teaming up and also by learning. So you need to reach out, you need to interact. I think you need to uh, participate in, in the society of, of scientists, but try to, to, to change gears toward the healthcare sector, I think that's the main important part that we have done. So close collaboration with the medics, uh, with the healthcare, healthcare providers directly, staying close to the patient. I think that's very nicely uh, exemplified in your presentation. And because you have mentioned legislation, 
um, what would be um, what what would be the context, the legislative text to operate? So let's say, uh, what kind of uh, ethics permits and allowances would need to be uh, closely considered and implemented within the context of clinical theomics? Yeah, I mean, th this is extremely important. Yeah. It's also actually a lot of administration, which is a burden. But I do believe that, um, I mean, you have the biobank law um, in the European Union. You have uh, BBMRI as an organization in, in Brussels that actually keeps uh, all the member states together. And they work out the procedures together. So it's always based upon uh, ethical basis. And don't forget that, um, you know, in the end of the day, the patient will be the owner of the samples, and the patient is also owner of all the data generated. Doesn't matter if it's uh, pathology, I mean, histological reporting, or if it's uh, proteomics data, whatever type of data that is, the patient in the end will, will be the, the, the key person. So one way, of course, is, is to keep up with that. Um, when you go to uh, North America, you have uh, other things that you, you need to think about and care about. If you go to Asia, like um, South Korea, Japan, China as well, uh, they will never, ever allow any sample to leave the country. Uh, and that's the case now in, in additional states. However, in, in Scandinavia, we are, and also Europe, we are mostly active. This is not a problem. So you can do that. But I think that you need to align uh, to a central a part and also now the integrity of the patient and the patient material and the data generated with the new reg regulations now with PDGR is very important. So that, that you, you need to keep a strong eye on that and you actually you need persons who takes care of it so if you run a bigger operation like i showed you i mean i have seven scientists and people in my biobank team and they are responsible to keep up and all the all the steps that has that does include samples need to be electronically uh, surveyed so you need to track you need to be trackable everything you do yeah and uh, speaking of uh, being able to track, so track samples, track changes, track protein signatures that you were referencing to in your, in your presentation. So you mentioned um, protein expression. So the is in regards to protein expression, you mentioned 27 proteins being associated with long, medium, or short-term survival. Um, looking within melanoma, are these proteins uh, specific, would you say, for melanoma-associated mechanisms, or it, are they representative of a broader, possibly broader type of oncology? That's actually a very, that's, that's a tricky one. Now, the answer, the answer is that it's, um, it's broader. So it's not only specifically uh, proteins that are associated with with uh, tumor developments in melanoma. Uh, it's also other general, so inflammatory markers and other uh, proteins that are regulated. So in this uh, Primero study that we published, uh, this is a pretty narrow um, uh, class of patients. So here we have collected, this is a, a Swedish cohort uh, with uh, uh, metastases. So, in here, we actually could find that. And you can also, we did blind tests, so you can clearly see the, which group uh, the patient uh, belongs to, whether they will have longer survival or, or shorter. Mm. Yeah, so uh, thank you. And um, another question, again, oriented towards protein, how well, can you get reproducibility in the cancer studies and is reproducibility correlating to, to samples or so sample dependent somehow 
so tissues in your case or extrapolate towards uh, other types of biopsies or body fluids, but from your experience? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, uh, I, I think that the last years have been extremely quickly developing in, in terms of, of uh, let's say, quality of data, and that is technology uh, driven. So right now, I mean, you can do studies with uh, TMT approaches or, or even non-labeled where the, where the narrowness of the expression, and, and we are talking about um, high numbers, are extremely good. So that part, I think, has been taking a major development. So it's not like in the old days, you, you get you know one sample from the other and you run it in between days. So within day performance, but also in between days, I think uh, is, is very, very good. Um, yeah, okay, so the type of sample, I mean, if you compare, for instance, blood with, with tissue, um, in, in blood you have like 10, 11 orders of magnitude expression. So that is really challenging. Um, and there is a lot of development on that area. So that has to take specific considerations. When it comes to tissue, I think the, um, the type of tissue uh, will also determine uh, the sample preparation part. And I would say that the key is, is on that front line. If, you, if you're able to solubilize into a liquid, uh, a, a any tissue material, uh, you're probably okay. Um, if you take, for instance, pancreatic cancer, that is probably one of the highest uh, stromal containing, so connective tissue containing uh, tumor type, that is very, very difficult to get all of it solubilized. It's a challenge. So it depends on which tissue type. Soft tissue is usually easier, um, while others are more uh, tricky. Now, when it comes to expression, then you also find that dependent on, on the um, compartment uh, of the tumor that you work with, will also determine how well, if it's a lot of repeat of proteins and you have a more narrow expression, or if you are the wider where you have infiltrating leukocytes, you have stromal, you have different, many clones of, of cancer cells within the tumor, that will also give a spread. But I would say in, in general now, uh, we are running uh, also other, um, like in lung cancer studies now, I would say that um, even with uh, paraffin blocks, uh, we are able to get very high reproducibility so I think we, we've, we've actually may have pr performed a milestone now, also on the paraffin side. So we are doing like hundreds of, of tumors that we never have been able to do before. And we can do, it didn't show data today, but we can do a phosphospeciation on that. So that's, that's another area where you can sort of link the drug impact and the signaling. And Thank you for this very detailed response. Phosphospeciation is something that we will listen in the second part of, of the webinar. So maybe before, before taking a short break of half an hour, we would have time for one concluding question. And that is in relation to how could protein atlas be used for clinical purposes for treatment of cancer patients or diagnostic purposes? Well, I, I, you know, I think that the proteomics field, perhaps without really knowing it or sort of realizing it, has the power in their hands. I think we are there, actually. And I think that you as, let's say, instrumental providers and technology provider, you have a big responsibility because I believe that we, we actually got there. So the protein as a functional component uh, within healthcare for being able to, to get the right reporting on a stage of disease development or which type of drugs we should use or how we should treat the patient. That is extremely difficult 
uh, decisions for a clinician to make. And I'm convinced uh, that we will be able to use proteomics uh, to provide uh, tools to make it better. So, Professor Marco Varga, thank you once again. And uh, looking forward to having you join the roundtable discussion. So, for our audience, thank you for joining us. And uh, now we have a half an hour break. Please take a coffee, a tea, and do join us in half an hour when we have a, a list of uh, outstanding speakers continuing with presentations on the topic of cancer challenges and analytics to help us resolve biology. So thank you and see you in the next session.